Hey folks, welcome to this month's Dialogues and Debates, our panel discussion series in conjunction with the Mozilla Festival. My name is Xavier Harding, and I'm on the content team here at the Mozilla Foundation. Today, we're talking about voice-based AI and virtual assistants. Some of these include things like Alexa and Siri, but it kind of goes far beyond that too. Voice-based assistants aren't new, but as they've become more popular, they shed a light on some new problems over the years. One of the biggest problems being how these voice interpreting computers are trained in the first place. For example, if I tell Siri to set a timer, there's a lot that goes into teaching Siri how to parse that across tones of voice and accents and manners of speaking and a lot more. The big question is, are all examples of speech or all ways of speaking represented equally? If they're not, what are the repercussions of that? That's what we're here talking about today. Joining today's panel are Hillary Juma. Hillary is a community manager here at Mozilla, Mozilla's Common Voice, which is based in the UK. She's based in the UK. Uh, Common Voice is an open source initiative to make voice technology more inclusive. Contributors donate speech data to a public, public data set, which anyone could then use to train voice enable technology. It's actually pretty cool. Kathleen Simon Yu, I messed up her name's pronunciation, um, <laughs> but <laughs> she's laughing. Uh, but she's an AI researcher based in Khalifa, Kenya. Uh, she's focused on natural language processing for African languages. She also works in Mozilla. Uh, we're happy to have her here. Johan Diedrich, based in New York, is Director of Engineering at Somewhere Good. That's, that's the name of the company. I'm not just saying Somewhere Good. Uh, Johan's also a 2021 Mozilla Creative Media Award recipient and an adjunct professor at NYU's ITP program. Uh, Johan is a badass. Kola Tugosun is a writer, linguist teacher, currently based in Lagos, Nigeria. In the past, Kola has worked at Google as a speech linguist, project manager, and project manager for natural language processing. Kola is also a badass. We are... Am I allowed to say ask? I don't even know. We're here today talking about voice <laughs> AI. I want to kind of just kick things off with just a, a general question. Who's getting left behind and why is it a big deal when it comes to uh, virtual assistants and voice-based AI? Maybe we can start with Hillary. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'd say firstly, most languages in the world um, so like there are like over 6,000 languages and currently um, like Alexa and Siri don't actually support any native African language. So like that means that when people are interacting with these technologies, they have to either like possibly rely on second languages such as English and not be able to speak in that, like their, um, their primary language. Um, but it also like disservices people that are like um, gender minorities. Um, so, like for example, there, we know that there's bias for um, like towards like female voices, and like sometimes like voice recognition technology is not necessarily always trained on people that are like non-binary. So, like um, I would say that in terms of that, my that's my response. I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. Yeah, Cola, what do you think? Who who when we talk about Alexa and Siri, uh, even Google's assistant, who's getting left behind? Who doesn't get the same experience as everyone else? Yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, of as uh, someone from a, uh, a country that has over 500 languages, we already have a problem with trying to get everyone um, to be able to access these technologies in the same way. Um, and adding colonialism that has imposed English sort of as a language of, of uh, the society um, and a language that serves as a, a kind of unifying language where you know, people who come from different language communities can use, um, and a language that kind of excludes uh, the ways of education. Then you have a problem when technology comes and people have to navigate through this language to be able to access it. So for instance, in Nigeria, until the Google Voice um, was launched, in, uh, the Nigerian English uh, Voice on Google Assistant was launched in uh, 2019, um, Uber riders, you know, had, to, uh, they, they could use the voice technology on Google Maps, but many times they couldn't understand what the voice was saying because sometimes even the street names that were local street names could not be pronounced in the appropriate uh, way. And so, you know, they, they sometimes misled, were misled by the technology. And so um, having the Google a Nigerian accent in the Google voice, a lot more people were, you know, helped and uh, allowed to be able to use the technology and, you know, he could pronounce the street names properly and stuff like that. But it's still yeah. in English, it's still in Nigerian English. And there's some, several people who don't speak English at all in Nigeria today, and they are still being left behind. And that's uh, you know, how I look at the technologies that we have and we use 
and how much uh, how much people have been left behind because they don't speak the language of the space. For sure, and I want to get Kathleen in here too. When we talk about people who get left behind in the virtual assistant fun, if it is fun, because some of it's kind of fraught, uh, who comes to mind? I think uh, Kola and Hillary pretty much sum it up. There's come to be this persona of white male that for some reason is the human persona that digital platforms are ideally tailored for, which means that if you are female, if you are not white, if you are not American, not English speaking, then your experience is completely different. And it's largely because the people in that room are not designing the, the technology for you. So if you sound different, if you speak a different language, then we find that um, you are being left behind. And as we go to smaller and smaller subsets and at intersections of subsets, then I guess you find that the demographics are being left behind to different extents. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting and very wide reaching problem, I'd say. Yeah, and Johan, to get you in here, I remember a story you told me about your father and his experience with virtual assistants. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, both of my parents are Jamaican and um, have been living in the U.S. for quite a while now. And um, what kind of brought me into this space was, was um, you know, overhearing my parents, specifically my dad, speaking to Alexa and, and realizing, you know, kind of hearing how it didn't recognize his, his accented, heavily accented English speech. And it, you know, kind of dawned on me that, like, we talk about these uh, technologies working on, in this case, English, but English is, it, it is there's a spectrum of, of, of English. It's, it's, it's a lot more diversified than um, what, what, what we might think of. And um, these do want, these technologies are trained and do want to work on standardized and generalized forms of a, of a language. And anything that, that deviates outside of that, um, you know, the user has to kind of course correct. And so you have a kind of code switching that happens where people are having to modulate their voice to work on these or work with these interfaces. And the insight was that, you know, for Black Americans, uh, in, in the case that I can speak to, that code switch in the external world, um, doing things you know, interfacing with banks or jobs or education, socializing, et cetera, um, that sort of code switching happens for white years. And in this turn, we're seeing code switching happening um, for AI years. And I think the, the parallel and connection between those two phenomenon are um, you know, hard to deny and, and, and what kind of brought me to this. Yeah. This and I have to imagine not everybody watching may you know, understand the idea of code switching, even if they do understand the term code switching, may not have lived it. But I think it's really interesting when you put it that way, because, you know, considering how prevalent voice based computers are becoming, you know, to use a web browser, I don't have to switch how, switch anything about my culture, really, or like to use uh, a smartphone, I don't really have to fully kind of uh, change anything about my culture, but like to, to have Alexa understand me, I have to maybe talk a certain way, or, or your parents and your dad has to talk a certain way. And I don't think we've seen that before in such a stark example in computing and, and in, in computers. So I'm, I'm just scared. I don't know. I'm just scared. I'm just worried. Maybe not scared, but a little bit worried. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, the only thing I can think of is maybe like text and the way in which someone might speak through text in in dialect and in slang and, and how, you know, we have autocorrect, we have these kind of fuzzy matching uh, tools that can kind of, uh, you know, bridge that, bridge that divide. Um, I, don't, I don't know or think that speech recognition, speech recognition technology is working at the same capacity when it comes to voice interfacing versus, versus text in that case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do we think this, kind of blind spot exists? Is it because other languages are just so much harder to understand in English? Is it a matter of who has a seat at the table? Why do we think this problem exists? Uh, if I may, um, I think um, 
it's you've, you've hit a little on the head. It's about who is uh, creating the technology and um, whose interest has been served by the technology that's been created. Uh, I, I mentioned in an excellent while ago that Siri, uh, the, um, the, the uh, AI voice on the Apple phones, um, exists in Swedish, Norwegian, um, Danish, Icelandic, this Norway and um, Scandinavian languages, which are in total not more than 20 million speakers. And it doesn't exist in Yoruba, which is spoken by about 30 million speakers, just one language. And it exists in those small languages. So um, we can't say the number of speakers that influences the creation of these voices, because there are many African languages with huge numbers of speakers. I also have about 50 million speakers. Igbo has about 30 million, etc. cetera. Um, and so it is who is sitting at the table deciding that this is why we need this um, service. This, this is the people we are targeting it at. Um, it could be that they assume that people who speak Yoruba don't have the money to buy the devices that they are creating. Um, so there is economic factor. There are you know, factors that are decided in the boardrooms where not everybody is uh, present. And that's such an interesting point about the idea that, okay, where are we going to make the most sales? Probably, they, they're thinking Precisely. probably white English-speaking countries. That's so interesting. Exactly. But at the end of the day, there are people who speak Yoruba um, and who, who buy the devices, who buy the iPad, who buy the iPhone. My grandfather, I always mentioned, um, could read and write in Yoruba, but he couldn't write in English, but he had a phone. So whenever he got a text message, he had to call someone to come and read it to him and explain what is there because... Even if he could read it, if he could write it in the language, he has to first, you know, navigate the phone to where the text message is. Um, so if there are voice technologies that exist in his language, then he could, you know, when the text comes in, the phone can alert him that there is, um, you know, a message and then you can get there and then you can have it read to you. Um, I also mentioned uh, the, uh, the situation in Nigeria where you couldn't use ATMs, the cash machines, in any other language apart from English. For a long time, you could only use an ATM in English, which means that anybody who doesn't speak in English would be scared to put the money in the bank because they can't get it out from the ATM machine. Uh, over the last couple of years, uh, months, actually, I've started seeing some ATM machines have the text translated into Af Nigerian languages, three Nigerian languages. But there's still a problem because not everybody who can speak Nigerian languages can also read it. So if I can speak to someone, it doesn't mean that when they see the text on the, on the screen that they can read it. So we need voice technologies that can allow them to either speak to the machine and be able to get you know, the machine to understand what they're saying or have the machine speak to them and respond to their challenges. So there are a lot of uh, blind spots, I think, that exist in technology. I don't always blame the big tech, uh, even though you know, they have the power to do it. Um, I think local tech uh, people also have a responsibility to look into these spaces and create opportunities that can benefit not just in terms of language, but also in economic uh, uh, ways, like I've mentioned, uh, the, the banks and stuff like that. Yeah, Kathleen, I think you wanted to add on to that. Yeah, I think another aspect that makes this skew is just the fact that um, we largely do not have the capacity. And when I say we, I mean in Africa, right? So I think it's partly due to the fact that AI skills um, to gain them, a lot of times you have to go somewhere off of the continent. Um, and even on the continent, yes, we are now having universities that teach AI courses or can support you to study an AI course. But then you also find that compared to the rest of the world, these units are being introduced a lot later than elsewhere where it may be in your primary or secondary education. And beyond um, capacity or support to build these skills, there's also the fact of funding. And I think there's a huge skew in terms of funding for research if you compare the rest of the world versus Africa. And at the end of the day, the truth is if, if you give me a tool, I'm going to look around in my environment and think to myself, okay, what can I use in my immediate environment to do with this tool? And so I think the problem that Kola mentions is also largely because maybe we don't have enough um, Africans or whatever underrepresented language or context you want to say, enough people who are well resourced with the capacity to just sit down and think, okay, this is a tool, it can solve problems, what problems can I begin to solve with it? Yeah, one follow-up question I would want to ask you is, you know, do we have any ideas around how do we get low resourced places and populations who could potentially benefit the most? How do we get them the voice resources and capabilities that they may need? 
Yeah, I think we'll start. Um, well, go on, please. Go on, Catherine. Okay, I, I'm going to say that there's now increasingly many grassroots communities that are coming up to do this work and supporting them would be a great start. So locals will have the insight into what the local community is able to do or what the resources they need are. And those are the people that I would empower to spearhead those efforts. So going straight from, right from designing a curriculum or um, being able to, um, elucidate what resources are needed, whether it's credit to bundles or uh, laptops to be able to begin learning how to code or just funding to work with linguists and writers to create text resources or voice resources that can then become data sets. And then there's also the fact that um, training AI models requires a lot of compute and compute is super expensive. So I always see this as, a, as another hurdle. We talk a lot about democratizing AI skills, but then we fail to mention the fact that the models that are currently powering Google Translate or Google search are trained by resources that go to the billions and only big tech has those resources, right? So how do we deal with that? Yeah. And just, just to add on to that, um, a lot of coding languages that are used to, I mean, well, there are a lot of coding languages that are used to train these models are written in English. Mm. So like, how can you even code if you have to have to be able to speak English in the first place to actually engage with the coding language and like I'm encouraged to see like there's this project that I came across lost um via Twitter by this person called Kalibu called Pi Swahili and it was like a Swahili version of um a version of programming language to allow Swahili speakers to get started with programming so like people creating resources that also and that project is open source so like, people can build on and create their own versions of it um but yeah I just agree with everyone what has been shared so far that's awesome. Like, Kola, what were you going to say earlier? Um, I have forgotten, but there's some other idea just came to me that um, okay. with Yoruba, for instance, which is the language I, I speak and I have uh, some knowledge about, um, part of the problem is, you know, along with all the problems we mentioned, there are other fundamental problems that prevent, um, that kind of, you know, hinder the work that many of us are trying to do to get your back, um, you know, more globally recognized in AI in the web space. So for, for instance, your is a tonal language, and by which I mean, when you write it, you have to put, uh, I mean, it's a tonal language, you use tone and the, the pitch uh, height to, de uh, to demarcate the meaning of sound. So I can say over and over, and they mean different things, uh, even though they're spelled almost the same way. Now in writing, we have to put marks on top and on, under these words, to uh, disambiguate them. Um, there are not enough resources to write Yoruba uh, with the appropriate tone marks. For a long time, people just wrote, you know, with the English uh, alphabet without the ability to put the marks on them. And as you know, uh, trying to get data, um, if you go online and try to search for Yoruba texts, and you find all the texts you find don't have the appropriate markings, then they're useless, right? Um, and so to be able to write properly in Yoruba, you needed you know, uh, an organization like uh, Unicode to empower Yoruba to be able to you know, be written online. But there are still problems, even with Unicode, in how Yoruba is written. Um, there are several languages that have pre-composed uh, letters that have the marks on top and under already specified. But for Yoruba and many African languages, you have to, the longer, it, it takes a longer process to write. If you have to write a vowel and then put the mark on top and put the mark in it because Unicode hasn't created a standardized pre-composed text. And that has caused a lot of problems for those who want to create a corpus for the language. Uh, and so while we're dealing with the, you know, being able to get data and all of that, you know, even being able to write it properly, uh, you need a lot of hurdles you have to go through to get through. So, so I believe there's a lot of work to be done and we need big organizations as well as local ones as well. Yeah, let's talk about the work that needs to be done. I want to give you all space to brag about the cool things that you all are doing um, because, you know, you got to, you know, tell people. Maybe we start with uh, Johan, Dark Matters. Yeah, talk about what you've done in this space. Sure. Um, so Dark Matters is an interactive web experience um, that spotlights the absence of Black speech in data sets that are used to train Siri, Alexa, Google Home, um, really giving people this opportunity to experience um, very viscerally like what's inside of a speech data set, what does it contain, 
um, the metadata associated with it for people who haven't, you know, encountered a speech data set. I think it's really kind of interesting to hear the kind of phrases and, 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 and sentences and words that are then, um, you know, from the bottom of that, that bubble up into what we kind of know as, as a speech recognition. Um, but the work is also meant to um, give form to that, that void, that data void inside of these data sets and to insert in that, in that space um, speculation, uh, speculative uh, texts um, to kind of think of through like how and why, um, like what a, a, a more just technological future could be and look like and sound like um, for uh, you know, black people um, across the world. So um, very much look, taking a, a, you know, a very small subset of this, this problem, let's say, um, and just looking more so at, at the fact that, you know, these technologies don't work as well for black speech because of the lack of data inside of the data sets that are that we're using right now. Yeah, that's good. Um, Carl, I want to end on Hillary because it's Mozilla and she works here. And so I think we'll go to Cola for now and maybe Kathleen after and then Hillary. So Cola, how about you? Yes, um, in 2015, I uh, started this project called yourbandname.com, um, which is in the software is just a dictionary of Yoruba names. Um, but what I intended to do with it um, is to create a crowdsourced uh, platform where all Yoruba names can be pulled together, but also uh, a place that can give us a chance to create text to speech uh, possibilities. Because to have a dictionary and have to hear the sounds pronounced, you need it um, in a way that doesn't include having one person pronounce over 10,000 names. Um, so we created a text-to-speech uh, functionality, uh, which is the first time it was done for Yoruba. The dictionary itself is also open, uh, open source. And part of this is to create a corpus for Yoruba language that can benefit people who want to do other work in the future. Um, I'm also working with a number of people, um, including Masakane, uh, to translate scientific um, texts uh, into African languages, this time for Yoruba for me. Um, and we also try to do a lot of uh, automatic speech recognition work for Yoruba as well, both uh, monolingual and uh, code switch, code switching. Um, all as a way to make sure that uh, AI is more familiar with African languages, Nigerian languages, and Yoruba especially, and a few other things like that. That's awesome, Kathleen. Brag about the work that you do. So I think Hillary should go first because okay. I work on a niche aspect of a project that she works more widely on. That's a good point. Hillary, brag about the work that you do. Cool. So um, I'm part of the Common Voice team as the community manager. Um, Common Voice essentially is a resilient initiative to ensure voice enabled technologies can understand real people. So essentially, we have a lot of language communities and contributors that have helped us to create the Common Voice data set, which is an open source project that anyone can have access to and download. And essentially, contributors provide um, public license text um, that people then read um, that are created into voice clips and then these voice clips are then validated by others and then included into the data set and when people create their profiles they can optionally share with us demographic data such as accent, gender, age to help us really understand the makeup of the data set and help to tackle some of the um, underrepresentation that we mentioned earlier in this conversation. Um, so to kind of give an example of like how the data set is currently being used so um, Community members in Rwanda, they're creating this, pro they've created this project called Embeza, which essentially is a, um, a chatbot, a, um, a project which aims to create a conversational chatbot with speech to text and text to speech um, that can be used to provide accurate information about the pandemic in Rwanda, French and English languages. So that's what I do. And I support the language communities by um, supporting documentation and creating opportunities and experiences of experiences for them to influence like product decisions. So for example, today we had like a session on like act, um, some work, act some workflow work that we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Okay, now Kathleen can go. So as part of Common Voice, I work particularly with the Kisahidi speaking community. And we recently kicked off efforts to create a speech recognition data set for Kiswahili. So um, at this point, largely what we've been doing, I'm one of three fellows that are focused on this project and we've been talking through the best way to go uh, about engaging the wider community, um, how to go about the data collection efforts and also being very sensitive to the fact that 
that um, given the head start that the rest of the world has, we are aware from the mistakes they've made that uh, recognition systems are likely to be biased towards men than women, for example, or younger populations as opposed to older populations. And yes, even though there are technical means that you can go, you can go about mitigating these factors, um, I think they're best dealt with at the data collection stage. So part of community engagement is also going to just be making sure we are actually reaching the populations that are at risk of um, not having these systems work on them. Then Kiswahili is widely spoken, and I'll say that among Kiswahili speakers, there's a lot of diversity that may not be at first or immediately obvious to external populations. So there's a wide variety of dialects, accents, and even just variations. So that's another aspect that we're having to figure out. Like if we created a Kiswahili data set, would it be useful in DRC where they mix Kiswahili with French versus in Kenya where we mix it with English? Um, if we created a data set for use cases in agriculture, would it be useful in a village at, along the Kenyan coast where the Kiswahili dialect is somewhat different from standard Kiswahili? And so the word for say potato is slightly different from what the word for potato is in, in um, standard Kiswahili. So there's a lot of nuance to the data collection process. And I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this work. We're, we're about to kick off a linguist, an engagement process or exercise with linguists to figure out all these nuance. And um, I'll say I'm excited about the multidisciplinary nature of this work, because a lot of times we talk about needing to have the correct people in the room. And we've talked about what um, leaving out certain demographics from the solution process can result in. And I think another aspect of that is if we techies just sit in a room and say, hey, I mean, it's a technological solution, we're gonna build it, there's gonna be gaps because it's also a language solution. So we need the, the linguists in the room, essentially. That's great. Do, should, the, should this be on the big tech companies to fix? I, when you say I'm excited about this work, I feel bad that it's like, my question is like, should we even be doing this work? Should you all even be doing this work? Shouldn't Amazon, because they make Alexa and Apple and Google, shouldn't they be the ones to fix this? What do, what do you all think? Maybe we could start with Johan. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard question. I, 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 I mean, I, I'm not really too sure how to answer it. It almost feels like a moral question. Like, like, should they do it? I think yes, but it, it also kind of depends on what their, uh, what, what their what their end game is right like their end game might not actually be um you know ubiquitous uh accessibility for all languages all the times across all peoples and cultures so um should they do it yes i i don't know if that if that's really saying much though i mean i i think they are doing it and um i don't necessarily know if external pressure is going to be the thing that that kind of helps to to, to change this um i think there's maybe another kind of you know thing in this conversation space around that um just the the technology and the the the, the basic assumptions around how it's built um might need to be challenged altogether so maybe it's not even we're not even trying to talk about large companies deploying voice interface systems into people's homes and lives, but maybe there is, as I think some people are suggesting, a, a different version of this where it does begin from the bottom in communities at a, at a, like, a hyper-local uh, place and it kind of uh, grows and emerges that way. So, yeah. Kind of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I don't want to go to the next question just yet because I, I do want to know what the rest of you think. I mean. These sure. tech companies have billions of dollars. They are the ones making this technology in the first place. Do we think a little bit of the onus or more, more of the onus should be on them to fix this? Do we trust them to fix it without any so, ulterior motives of probably just making money? Yeah, Cole, you should get into Yeah, so having uh, worked as, um, you know, as a linguist at uh, a big tech company, 
And having worked as an activist before then, because the Yoruba project, I started that uh, the same year as I got to Google, but like a few months before. Um, at the time, I was worried when I was being given the job, like, you know, is being, me being working, working in this big company, am I, am, I, am I letting go of my own desire to, to be a part of the solution without there being a big profit motive uh, you know, interest? But I was working on Yoruba at the time, I was employed to work on Nigerian English. Um, but what I found uh, while working uh, inside Google um, is that it's also good to be to have a seat at the table. And they who are employing you, who are bringing you in, may not even know much uh, everything about the system, the environment where, you know, even though they have an idea to work, you know, to create an Nigerian English voice, for instance. Um, while I was working, my work again was to localize the English accent from US and American uh, and, and British to Nigerian English. But there was another problem that they hadn't noticed, which is the, um, the fact that the, the maps would need to be able to pronounce local names, um, or uh, Lekia by Expressway, you know, all of those things. And if I had focused only on what I was employed to do, which is to localize the accent, we would have a Nigerian English accent on the device, but we would also have a Nigerian English accent, which is still terribly pronouncing local names. And to be able to make it be able to pronounce local names properly, we had to then extend the mission, so to speak, um, extend the, the scope of the work I had to do, uh, and bring my own knowledge of Yoruba and Nigerian, English, Nigerian languages to bear on the work that I had been invited to do focusing only on English. And because you know, I had a good manager and I had a lot of people who listened, um, we were able to expand and not focus only on the Nigerian English accent, but also the local languages. So I assume that if I hadn't been there, if they had employed someone um, who just did what they asked them to do, we would have Nigerian English, but we would have excluded even more people. Uh, you know, we have a Nigerian English accent pronunciation, pronunciation, but it will still mess up the local their names. Um, so I think there is a role for the big companies because they have the money and the resources. But there is a, a role for people like me and others who are working to also, uh, while they're doing their own work, also get a, a, a access to these spaces so that they can bring their own knowledge and their own ideas about how the environment should be into this space. Um, I hope that kind of answers the question. Yeah, for sure. Actually, this is something Hillary and I have talked about a little bit before, where, where the, this scenario where underrepresented people are, underrepresented groups are putting in more work towards this, uh, than white people who kind of made this stuff in the first place, even like yeah. in representation of data sets um, mm -hmm. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hillary, do you want to chime in on that a little bit? Remember you mentioned something about like image net and facial recognition. Yeah, because I think um, to the point about like um, the labor being on like those that are marginalized, I think it's, it's unfortunate partly because sometimes it could be that um, you don't necessarily have the resources to do that and you, you need the support from other people to like to actually get buy-in especially like considering that a lot of big tech companies are based in the west and like sometimes like my, my point being is mainly like you can't do this in isolation it can't just be us alone and um like we we do need people to collaborate and support hence why like even our project itself it's open source we 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 try and get buy-in from like community members to like take part and like contribute because like it's, I think, um, cause at the same time, like I see my comment in regards to like essentially at the burden of representation being a marginalized people, both as like a kind of like a, a two coin thing because at the same time, like how are you going to ensure that we're centering their voices and like they have agency within this decision. So it's kind of like not them just being the bird, like the burdeners of the work, but more also them being actually like, human beings that have agency within those processes because I think at the same time, like to your earlier question about like, should big tech um, like diversify essentially their language that they cater to? I believe so, yes. But I think at the same time, they need to understand why and like, how are you possibly making people hyper visible in the, in the case of like, for example, how um, ways in which like ImageNet has been used to use speech recognition that has then marginalized like um, black and brown communities because of like its, its inability to find people in the first place. Um, so like, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance between like, how are these technologies being deployed and, and why? And like, and like um, um, yeah, I hope that makes sense, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it does. Um, should we just get rid of all these things? Like, should, should we just get rid of Alexa and Siri? Like, is it just, are we just better off without them? Like, is that, <laughs> is that a crazy idea? Cola, talk to me about this. Like, what do you think? 
No, I, I think it's good that technology exists. Um, like I said, I think of my grandfather, he's passed now, but when he was around, I, I, I often wonder how, how, you know, how much more he would have been able to, you know, access this big, big tech, communicate with people from around the world, etc. if he had the means, the technological means to do so. I think it's good technology. Uh, it's, it's helped us in some way. Um, it's had its own issues, but it's it's kind of development. Um, it's nice. I mean, of, of course, at some point, I, I I'm, I'm happy at occasionally when I realize that the computer doesn't understand everything uh, in Yoruba because one day robots might be taking over and all that. So when I when I get into my conspiracy mode, I, <laughs> I'm happy that robots can understand everything I say. But I think. It's good that uh, technology exists, um, and uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it just exists a platform. It's what we do with it that matters. And if um, we're thinking about our environment, our society, and what we want to do with ourselves, uh, we'll be able to, to tune it and, and, and bend it to fit our own uses, and that's what's most important. Should we just get rid of Alexa? Sorry, for me or for Kathleen? Oh, I said Kathleen, but... <laughs> oh, I, I didn't catch that. Um, no, I don't think we should get rid of Alexa. And I say this because beyond making the lives of able-bodied, educated human beings easy, it actually opens up accessibility for differently abled populations. So exactly. think about the blind, for example. The blind? Yeah, the blind would benefit from technology that has voice prompts or if we come into low um poorer settings let me say that then individuals who've not had an opportunity to learn to read and write it does open up accessibility for them to have voice activated or voice prompt devices at their disposal so i think technology overarchingly is beneficial for us and we just need to get with the program and make sure that it's beneficial for everyone as opposed to skewed towards some people versus others. Very true. Yeah, I remember Hillary and I were talking recently, you, you were mentioning the idea of kind of like, like reverse anthropology in a way where if we do have underrepresented groups working on this, kind of a different lens. Maybe you want to talk about that more because I may not be able to describe it in the way that you can. Cool. So um, basically, I was watching um, the Conference on Fairness, Accountability and Transparency earlier this year, and there was a talk about studying up, so reorientating the study of algorithmic fairness around issues of power. And essentially, they use this approach in anthropology, which is called studying up, and it focuses on like how does like power kind of like assert itself. And I think it's a way in which like we can use that as approach to really analyze the ways in which data is being used. So, for example, to give a context in like the UK, so um, there's this thing called the Gangs Matrix, which has been found by the ICO to have um, under overrepresented black men on it. So that data is then being used for surveillance. So, like I think if we really like investigate and study how the, the ways in which voice enabled technologies are being used and if they're not necessarily, for example, privacy preserving or they're used for surveillance, then like we should not have them. And we need to have leg legislative backing to, to support that because um, in the case of the gangs matrix, the um, GDPR and the equality law helped the ICO to make that decision. Um, ICO stands for the Information Commissioner Office. Um, apologies, I used to be a civil servant. <laughs> so, <laughs> acronyms are everywhere. Um, and I just wanted to add on to Kathleen's point about like, like why um, other groups, not just people that are like, that are marketed to as like using voice um, assistance. Like I myself, like I'm neurodivergent and like I've used um, things such as like equivalent of Dragon as a software to help me to interact with the internet and the world because like I need like dictation software to help me to communicate with other people. And like, if that, let's say for example, if I was to speak, another language and if what my language how can I really engage and access on the web and even to the extent of like the subtitling that is used automatically on zoom like for us on our end it looks like it mixes up words so like it said um automatically and it detected it as for me as an actress um before so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I like I, I rely on these to, to engage in, in in spaces on the internet so yeah oh my gosh um, we're getting kind of closer to the end of the panel discussion here. I want to have, I want to ask two more round table questions. 
I'll start with this one. What's the big takeaway you want folks to walk away from this panel with? You want what do you want folks ultimately to keep in mind as they move through the world and use these devices? We'll start with Jan. I had a feeling. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I appreciate the, that comment because I think it gives me this opportunity to kind of pull back out and, and think about this at a high level. I think for me, it's it's about cultural preservation and, 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 and the way in which there's so many forces in the world that, that really want to flatten diversity and really want to stamp out um, divergence um, from 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 generality and universality, and I want I want people to maybe take away this idea that um, you know your culture is not less valid because technology can't interface uh, properly with it, and we really need to to keep that in mind because I I feel like the the, the alternative is that tech once technology you know, as technology gets deployed onto us, we start to it starts to, it starts to chip away at at our at our, at our culture, at, at our diversity, and we start to to normalize in order to to be able to work with it. Um, or you know, maybe it's a, maybe it's a little more adversarial than that um, to defend against it. And so I I, I want to advocate for um, more messiness, more diversity, more uh, you know more outliers um, and technologies that can support that, um, which I don't think is gonna come from the top down. I do think, you know, one of the things that I, as an artist and technologist really um, think about and, and believe is sort of like my mission in some ways is to teach people that they can have agency when it comes to building and, and constructing technology that really then becomes um, our world and our environments. And so keeping that in mind that, um, you know, we, we, we can not just imagine, but, but literally make and create different kinds of futures is something that I, that I just want us to all keep in mind. That's such a good point. I think at the top of the show, I mentioned how, you know, the idea of flattening diversity and code switching, you don't really see that when you use a web browser, when you turn on your laptop. But I feel like I've definitely had those moments during autocorrect when texting, typing a name, it's like, did you mean, you know, Dave? Like, no, I didn't mean Dave. I meant the other name. Um, <laughs> Kathleen, let's go to you. Um, what's the one takeaway you want folks to walk away with from this panel? Um, I'm going to say particularly for the techie populations, just because you have the technology or the know-how to build a certain solution is not a good enough reason to build it. And I'll say particularly in situations where you are not part of the context that you're building a solution for. So we've seen a lot of instances of parachute science where researcher in Lab X far away in San Francisco or something thinks that just because they have a language data set pertaining to a completely different context, it's a good enough reason for them to build some solution. Um, and with catastrophic results in some cases. Um, on a more lighthearted note, I, I recently re read a paper, uh, some work by Masakane, where they did a survey of some of the some of the recently published papers in NLP that um, are very multilingual, right? So it's 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 very in right now in NLP research to do multilingual research. And the end game is the more languages you have, the bigger the model you're building. And so the more visible your research work is. So they did a survey of all these papers that had uh, or claimed to include African languages as part of their research. And they found that in some, if not most of those um, research efforts, uh, the data pertaining to African languages was scraped from online, which most of the data is, but then in some cases it wasn't actually text. It was just punctuation or Unicode or, you know, something had happened in the translation or at some pre-processing stage that meant the text was lost. But then the researchers who did the work didn't care enough to actually inspect if they were actually including an African language or whether it was just, you know, gibberish. Um, so yeah, I'll say just because you can and you're skilled enough and you have the tools and the resource and the, and the technology to build a solution is not a good enough reason to build it. 
Yeah. Um, let's go to Kola. Yes. Um, uh, what, what I want to take away, my, my, work, my word is, I think, to the communities um, in, in Africa, Nigeria especially, um, I've you know, addressed the tech community there um, you know, over, over the years. And even though there are other issues that you know, they, they, they give attention to in fintech, in agriculture, etc., I find uh, this, la this language issues to be equally important, like I've mentioned, it has economic significance as well. Uh, and they're not helpless. You know, we think about, as, as Johan, uh, Johan said, um, you know, we think that, you know, these things are just there. We should just take them as they come. But no, I think um, technology is there for everyone to use. And we have the skills and knowledge to be able to do so. We should um, be more proactive in how we, you know, get into this space and shape it to our, our ends. Um, as a writer, I didn't mention this earlier, I'm a creative writer. Uh, as well, one of the things I try to do uh, over the last couple of years is uh, try to see how I can use literature as well to help in um, expanding and creating a corpus uh, that can be used for uh, technology uh, in the future. I recently translated this book, um, A Collection of Poetry, Originally Written in English, into Yoruba. Uh, Yoruba is my language. And I did that because um, over time, interest in the African language literature has also diminished. and the reason again comes from the conditioning that you know if things are not in these hegemonic languages, English, Spanish, French, they are not important. And I think that's not true. And by being not just complaining about it, but doing something to make sure we create content in these languages, uh, in, in the space that I, that I uh, that I'm competent in, in literature, I'm also contributing um, text and data that can be used uh, by future uh, tech people in the future. So. Um, I think the, the power is in our hands and we should do as much as we can, as, as, as often as we can. Thank you. That's a really good point. So, okay, Hillary, what do you want folks to walk away with from this? Um, so I want folks to walk away with knowing that they have agency and that like this space isn't just for people that have technical skills. So to give a mm -hmm. like explicit example with Common Voice, you technically don't have to even code to take part. You just need to like donate or sec your, your voice for like, five seconds reading a, um, a text, that's just more than slightly five seconds, but um, to, to read one of the public licensed texts. And even then like um, tied to the point that Kola just shared about like, um, like having the dominance of English language and like also like, like the relationship between that and colonization, like um, a lot of, so a lot of text on the internet that um, isn't necessarily always like our content, I think creating that content and possibly even contributing it under like Creative Commons licenses enables us to like create content that reflects you and reflects your ideas, um, of course, with your consent. Um, so I'll just say like agency and creativity essentially. Um, so yeah. I love that. We got uh, actually a user, not user question, audience question. Uh, so I can get to my second final round table question after this question. Question is, what role does digital ethics play in ensuring ubiquitous affordances in voice assistance? I don't know if anyone wants to start. I'm kind of confused about the ubiquitous affordances part, but maybe I'm just, you know, not as smart as you all. Could you please write it down so that I can, I, I don't think I got the question. Can, sure, I'll put, I'll put it in our, little, uh, in our little panel chat. What role does digital ethics play? Um, do you think they're referring to like the the bit about like how like data is collected in um, voice assistants and trained somewhere else and like like voice the idea of voice prints and stuff? I just want to clarify. Yeah, that might be it. That might be it. What do you think about that? Um, ideally, like like the I like you shouldn't you shouldn't be training a system without your consent. That's what I believe. Like I don't feel like just because someone has a voice assistant in their house or home that it should be training their voice without their knowledge or consent so like I think digital ethics does play an important role in regards to like how that voice assistant is both like learning the person's voice but also the other people that interact with their environment that may not necessarily know about how it's being used so I think the intercept did like a really good piece on this explaining it um I can't remember the full thing but um I think it needs voice assistants need to be privately preserving that's basically my end point Definitely. That's a good, that's a good point. 
Um, okay, final question, I, round oh, table I, question. Oh, no, 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 yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, yeah just, just maybe to, to push that a little further too around just the usage of data and, and consent. I also think about the way in which the, the, the content of this data set and, and by extension, the people that have provided this content, um, it's usually used for economic gain. And um, I'm not here advocating for capitalism, but given that is the system that we kind of live currently in, um, people should get paid, get remunerated for um, the, the, the revenue that's generated from uh, these technologies that are being used by large uh, corporations to, to bring in uh, right. bonuses and whatnot. So um, I've been thinking and looking a bit into like things like data unions and the way in which we could maybe contractually um, make it so that any, any use of a data set and the kind of money that it might um, generate in return gets back into the hands of the people who have contributed to these data sets. And I think that um, talking about exploitation of uh, marginalized communities, um, the way in which you know, black and brown culture definitely uh, gets uh, monetized and, and that, that money doesn't really return back to those communities, we might think about ethical you know, as, as far as ethics can, can exist inside of a capitalistic system, getting that money back to people or remunerating them in some ways um, for their um, labor. Yeah, I see Cola not his head. He's like, pay me. You need to pay me. <laughs> Wait, Cola, what do, you, what do you have to say about that? Well, I agree. I think um, digital ethics are important. You know, we need to, you know, we can't just have devices spying people. Um, um, I, I don't know what the question is trying to say, but I, I think, you know, if, 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 if it's trying to ask whether the presence of, um, you know, tools that can acquire people's voices in their homes is making it hard for people to want to, you know, participate and use it, then I, I think I understand that. I think that's why we have rules and regulations about how to use these things. Uh, but it's also important, I, I guess, for, for, for the devices to be able to use the inputs they get from people's use of it um, to be able to improve uh, on the work. I think most of the problems we've had, I guess, with uh, many of the you know, um, automatic uh, uh, artificial intelligence tools that we created is that they, you know, we can use them like the, like the American English and uh, British English voices we have on our devices, um, but they don't take into account the fact that the errors we make while we you know, keep trying to speak in a way that can make it understand it, um, to be able to use it properly, um, they don't take that input into account into improving the system. If that happens, I guess we could have a better system uh, as time goes on. But again, there are ethical rules as to letting people know that their voice has been used for this purpose and that you know it's been used only for the purpose that it's been that is specified and not for something else uh, in the future. Yeah, especially for something so personal and something. Uh, uh, you know, I guess we're used to being stalked around the web and like, you know, our interactions that happen on our digital devices are tracked, but like your, our voice is like kind of a new frontier when it comes to this whole tracking thing. And it's also kind of personal in a certain way. It's, yeah. it's weird, the consent is so necessary. Um, okay, I do want to get to the final question, the round table question. You got a chance earlier to shout out yeah, the work that you- Kathleen, oh, Kathleen sorry, Kathleen. Yes, you can Oh, sorry, Kathleen, yes, I'm so sorry, Kathleen. <laughs> so, you can definitely go. I. I... I'd like to share that I recently learned that in um, text to speech, which is speech, speech synthesis, um, yeah. voice actors who contribute their voices to create these technologies actually remunerated extremely well. And it's because of the fact that there's going to be a system out there that sounds exactly like you. So you're essentially giving away biometric data. And I'm fascinated by the fact that in this instance, we are able to very quickly draw a one-to-one -one between this being my voice and you needing to pay me to use it in a system. But then when we come to speech recognition, where the data set required is, needs to be much more diverse. So you look for many different people and they're saying many different things and in very different acoustic settings. So noisy area, silent room, that kind of thing. When we start to look at the collective, it's very easy to disenfranchise everyone from the fact that they have contributed to the resulting system. So going back to whether we should be paid for our data, 150%, yes, <laughs> yes. For sure, and, and sorry, I almost like glossed over you there, but I, <laughs> I, I think, yeah, the biometric data part is such a key thing because of how um, 
I think about how, you know, how do I get into my iPhone, face recognition uh, or touch ID, fingerprint recognition. We don't know how that biometric data will be used in the future. Will it be used to detect, to authenticate Xavier Harding's accounts? And if so, like, you know, I'm just giving it away to Amazon so they can train Alexa and they can just have it live on their servers. Like mm -hmm. kind of a fraught, I don't know what just happened, but it was, uh, it was a loud noise. Yeah, it's kind of a fraught thing. Once it's out there, you can't get it back. Um, so that's a really good point. Um, mm -hmm. Kathleen, we're going to start with you for this next one because I'm so sorry again for glossing over you there. Um, yeah, final question is basically whose work are you all following to learn more about this topic? I think I want to leave viewers with resources and places they can go to kind of keep up with this over and over again. I don't want this to be like a one-off thing. I want them to see it in their feeds, keep up with this kind of topic. Who are some folks that you all are following or learning from on this topic? And we can start with you, Kathleen. So there's two main ones for me. First is a company called Ajala AI. And I, uh, I'll say them in particular because they're building voice tech for African languages. So that's their focus. Um, and I think the end game is to make this available in API format for developers to then build and use uh, applications that they desire or can imagine. Uh, they've got a couple of African languages already supported. I know. Kenya Rwanda is there and um, a couple of Nigerian ones. I can't remember which. Then second, second um, organization to watch is Kokwi AI. And they're making available um, somewhat similarly, but pre-trained models that would make building voice tech much easier for individuals or um, in contexts where you don't want to have to train a model from scratch. So they're doing the heavy lifting of collecting large data sets and pre-training those models and then different individuals in whatever context can then take those and fine tune them to the use cases they'd like. That's awesome. Hillary, who are some folks you're watching in the space? Um, just to echo um, Kathleen's love as one, I'd also um, highlight them. And they've also actually launched recently a key Swahili um, speech to text model as well, which is amazing. Um, I'd also want to highlight, so in terms of, um, more in terms of the ethics side, someone that really inspires me is Abiba Biharain um, on her work in regards to relational ethics and like how can we think about like relationality and essentially intersectional feminism when we're developing AI and centering communities. And then the second um, like project that I'm really inspired by is called SIB and it's um, by Feminist Internet and UAL Creative Computing School where they did like a participatory design project where they essentially made like this, they're working with um, non-binary and trans people who wanted to make like essentially like prototype this um, voice AI assistant that would highlight um, queer content. So that like is and also the voice AI also reflects like has like a queer voice essentially. Um, so like as in like they're not gendered um, in like how they they sound and how they interact. And it's just like beautiful to see how like from the the, the interface to like the um, the content and like the direction in which the actual voice AI goes into like involves all of those that are like affected by it. So yeah, that, that was really inspiring. So, That's yeah. awesome. Cole, Cole and Johan have the pens out. They they got some. They, they're taking notes of some furious uh, recommendations right now. I want to hear from. <laughs> I want to hear from both of you. Let's start with Cola for for now. Let's start with Cola. Yes. Um, well, first let's give kudos to uh, Mozilla Common Voice. I think uh, I, I liked what. She since I've heard about the project, I, I, I've you know, been impressed by it. I think it's a great idea to have democratized the collection of voice. And since it's not a for-profit motive, uh, it helps, you know, it, it's kind of does a work that a big tech would have had to spend a lot of money uh, and to do and to then pro pro proprietarize, so to speak, and make uh, into money. Um, so keep, keep up the good work. Um, I have a couple of other friends and colleagues are doing a couple of good work. There's the Masakane group, um, which has been doing a lot of work in um, getting data, and translating work into African languages. Um, uh, some of my friends are there as well, David Adelani um, and I, and a couple of other guys have written a couple of papers on um, diacritic restoration in Yoruba. I, I mentioned that earlier. Um, being able to create uh, a program that can automatically apply their critics to Yoruba language uh, so that, you know, like the, the automatic um, 
um, what's it called? This thing that corrects your grammar, grammarly and stuff like that. that you can apply those things to your about, you know, without having learned how to properly tone mark. If you're a Yoruba person that has grown up without learning the skill, you can have the computer then do that to you. So there's a lot of research going on there, and a lot of young people are you know interested in this space uh, as well. Um, um, I mentioned earlier. And then Rising Voices um, is a group that I participate, I contribute to, um, which is also interested in looking at what young people are doing in languages around the continent and featuring them on the website uh, risingvoices.org. Uh, um, that's awesome. So that's all for now. Thank you. That's great. Okay, yeah, you'll you'll go last. All right. Um, last but not least. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, echoing Cola, I mean, definitely Mozilla in the Common Voice project really has been instrumental in getting me kind of into this a bit deeper. Um, Cola, uh, as a, as a, you know, I, I, you know, someone who I've been talking with over the past year is definitely his, their work. I recommend everyone to go and check out and, and keep tabs okay. on, on, um, on Cola's work. Uh, the Coral Project out of, um, I believe the University of Oregon, is one of the few uh, projects that I know of that's specifically working on um, building African-American speech data sets. Um, Jennifer Lynn Stober, who wrote this book, The Sonic Colorline, um, really goes through the history of racialized listening practices and the way in which this idea of black English speech was, is constructed in the same way that race is kind of constructed. So um, I recommend this, shout out to Jennifer. Um, Anti-Racist by Design is a group out of uh, London that's um, working to get organizations to better understand how to um, think about building products and platforms that are anti-racist by design. Um, two other people, um, Rami Ron Morrison and uh, Raymond Amaro are two kind of scholars. Um, Raymond Amaro is, is putting out a book pretty soon called, uh, I want to get the name of it, uh, Machine Learning, Sociogeny, and the Substance of Race. So I think these two are, are really um, connecting Black studies um, and uh, technology studies, let's say for lack of a better term, to really kind of uh, you know, implode in, in the, the, this, this scenario and, and think about the history of uh, surveillance, uh, data collection, categorization, um, as it relates to the black body and how this uh, these kinds of biases kind of level up from there. And then lastly, I, I want to just shout out to the disability studies community because I feel like they have um, have been doing, I mean, they produce so much great um, foundational work that, that really allows us to think theoretically about um, what it means to talk about accessibility for marginalized communities, specifically Mara Mills and Amy uh, Hammeray, um, I think are doing uh, really wonderful work around a disability studies, specifically around voice and speech. That's awesome. All right, well, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you all were able to join me today and talking about this really important topic. Folks who want to follow your work can do so. They've seen your Twitter handles on the bottom of their screen this whole presentation. So yeah, Johan, Hillary, Kathleen, Cola, thank you so much for joining me today. That's been another Dallas debate. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming Thank through. So Thanks much. for agreeing to joining. Um, yeah, follow Mozilla at Mozilla on Twitter, on Instagram. Find more of these, more updates from us. Keep up with Common Voice, commonvoice.mozilla.org. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. See you next time. Thank you. Thank See you. you. See you.